take altimeters and we have a model with different diameters and see how the pressure affects each one because that was one of the questions of the accuracy of an altimeter is what's the diameter, what are the dynamics of air going around and do all the altimeters agree with the final altitude. And I thought there might be some interesting things to look at. Like as you're going up, there's pressure changes from different diameters uh, that are caused by the velocity of the air going around the outside of the model. So those are the sort of things I wanted to look at and see if you could do anything with that. So my approach was to use a model rocket with three isolated uh, payload sections uh, with a BT-50 section, uh, a BT-60 section, and a BT-20 section. And I put them up in kind of an odd order. Normally you'd expect skinnier at top. And instead it's like this, and we'll get to our drawing. But it's basically, I had a peanut altimeter here, here, and here in this model. So we had three perfect flight peanut altimeters, so these little jobs right here. It's a model rocket with three different sections, and uh, a ubiquitous laptop computer and printer, launch tower, and my mighty D launch controller, and uh, 54 2 C65 engines, and a D1070 engine. So here's the model. I've got uh, a rock scene drawing of it. So the M's in it are illustrating where the, the altimeters are. And of course, the engine in the back and a parachute in there. So a pretty standard model. And here it is. Uh, I'll show you a picture of Goofy Me standing next to it. So it comes off. And one thing that isn't shown too clearly is there are a number of 30 second of an inch diameter holes in here. There's a, a, a semi standard punch. You can order them online. You can get in online to punch the vent holes in. So there are uh, several in the front one, a whole bunch in the middle larger one, and a few in the smaller one at the, in the aft section. And the altimeters were labeled 4, 3, and 2 because the number one altimeter I ended up not using uh, for the, the payload sections when they were located. So I went on good flights with uh, the three engines. The first flight was with a C65 engine. And the data you're looking at here is the data that you get when you get it down and you listen to the beeps and it tells you how high it went and how fast it went. And you can look at the uh, first batch one in the C65 and the altitudes, the high altitude in all cases was pretty close together. They were within a foot, a foot or two feet for all the altimeters, which is less than a meter when you're talking contest. Uh, that's what you're looking for. So in terms of I'll say, uh, repeatability, uh, the altimeters did very well and at maximum altitude. It didn't matter where the rockets were, or the large diameter, the skinny, or the very skinny. Uh, that was true in all cases, but if you look at the maximum velocities, there's quite a change with the two smaller diameters tending to be closer together in velocity and the large diameter being different. And the interesting thing is in the D10 flight, the uh, max velocity in the middle one shows lower, whereas in the C65 it shows at a higher velocity. So interesting things happen in these things as they, as they fly. And the rest of the data is in Appendix 1, or, which I pull off an Excel spreadsheet, which you download electronically. And here is the nice data, the raw data that I gave to our partners and judges to, to peruse. And what I'm going to do now is try and manipulate things in such a way that I can get to that Excel spreadsheet. Is there magic to do this? I use this to bring down the mouse app so I Oh, okay. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a touch pad up here. Yeah, I'm looking at it. Oh, there we go. <laughs> and then to get out of, uh, hit escape. And then escape. visual out of, okay. Hit escape. Uh, top left. There we go. And then down below, let's see. Oh, yeah. That's, that's not the trick. Um, sorry. <laughs> I, should, I should have queued it up. So this one, this isn't coming out of its time. This one's a mea culpa on the, on the judge. I'll keep track of it. So we'll just, we'll just minimize this. Let's do the, the next one now.
should be first.
peaks agree, the little ejection point agrees, and the landing spot agrees. So that takeoff is where the delay occurred and not somewhere else. And we had the same thing in all three flights. And of course, I mentioned the D-107. That was the last flight I dared make because they have hot ejection charges and scorched the tube nicely and there's no longer a parachute in here because it shredded the parachute off. So that brought my, my experiments to a grinding halt. Uh, but one of the interesting things is as I'm watching this part of the model come tumbling down and um, it's tumbling but it comes down at a constant speed and my heart was beating very rapidly because of the $200 worth of altimeters and I was scared to death about to die. Fortunately, did not die. And let's see if I can find all these wonderful things that he's got set up for me here. That should have been down. Now let's see what I have good on D. And here's the D107 flight. And this is fun because as you look at it, We've got it both coming up and going down. And adjusting this one temporally is a little more difficult because part of that will launch, that separation launch the trip down because there it's starting to go, it's falling fast enough to have that split due to the uh, Bernoulli effect or whatever turbulence effects there are around the larger falling part of it. And you notice the, the data here is a lot rougher coming down, a lot of bumps. That's the detection of my heartbeat. <laughs>
how to get them all so that they were at the same time because that time factor, as you can see, is critical. If you go this way or that way, the pressure comparisons just don't jive or something. Now you had vent holes in there. Mm -hmm. Do you have the altitude of that? Do you already have vent holes? Uh, yes, you have to have all these little vent holes so that they can detect the atmosphere of pressure outside. So, so this is a, a competitive, it's like a competitive situation. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. And uh, here's, here's the model I actually use for uh, the internet's altitude. And it has the cover by tape, the little vent holes on it. Basically, you need them for the altimeters to work. Now, the, uh, the t you, you had a temporal difference uh, in the three. Mm -hmm. Did you notice that the, I, I was doing this real quick, it's like, oh, I wonder if they all three came over the same final altitude when all was said and done. And mm -hmm. it looked like they were pretty close, but maybe a, a meter or two difference. And what did you A couple of feet difference. I actually did the, uh, these, all those measurements were in feet. Uh, the altimeter manufacturer says, let's do altitudes in feet. But when I converted those to meters, they were all within one meter, each altimeter from one to the other in all three. Wow. So I guess in that sense, the fact that they all got pretty much the same altitude could convince you that they were like, if they were off by 50 meters, so they say. Yeah, then I would have, and that's why I felt, that was my one test. I'd like to have more than one test, but that, uh, and, and that's not as strong a test where they, they were all on the same thing, or if I flown them all and then several flights and changed out the meter around. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Touched on this already. The high altitude in every case was all three in the, in the big two. Uh, if you had an opportunity to do more of this, would you try swapping alter, alter, or, or two, 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 to yeah. make sure that it's not a systematic issue in that one alternative that mm -hmm. you so high? Uh, there's a I, I just, um, criteria for where altimeters can be relative to transitions. I need a chance to look it up. Uh, are these, is the lower one in particular, are they far enough away from the transitions that you would expect a, uh, kind of an artificial disruption from the, from the airflow? Um, they talk in terms of, I think, mean, four times the diameter from a transition. Okay. On the other hand, when sort of assumes that they're looking at a transition where it's going from smaller to larger. Yeah. And in this case, it probably is four, four times the diameter, right? Now, the larger one is probably less than it because it's a much larger diameter. Yeah, I, I remember seeing that there was one that I didn't remember what the numbers were. Yeah, and the, and the placement of the altimeter is really the placement of the vent holes. <clears throat> and of course, the way the world works, Bob and Chris anticipated most of my questions. Um, the other question, the, the, I, I was pretty impressed with the wall to wall data. The, 20 samples per second. Did you, did you feel that at, at the end of the day was that particularly useful or would life have been easier at a, at a slower sampling rate? I've had very mixed thoughts about that. In one sense, a uh, slower sampling rate would be nice. On the other hand, I think ultimately uh, running these, if I can run them through a spreadsheet and then take, say, several of them and then average them and then put them on something else so that you've got sort of a running average of what they are. Having more data that you can sort of compress in various ways is, is probably the way to go. Um, yeah, that wall-to-wall -wall data is fairly intimidating. In one sense, I'd like to say, okay, I'll pick those points out and that point out, and ultimately that might be what you have to do. On the other hand, when you see the one tumbling, and you know, I joked about it being heartbeat, but it's clearly it was tumbling and that was causing that. Then having this, a lot of it that you can average out over time would be an important thing to have. We have time for two, maybe three questions from the floor. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, it appears you've only measured the accuracy of the altimeters relative to each other. What about the absolute accuracy? Good question, because really what we're talking about to each other is kind of a precision thing, the absolute accuracy of altitude. There's a classic field like tracking, and then you have to gather people up. And there are issues with that as well. Uh, obviously, the records that are set, you say, okay, that's an altimeter uh, record versus a track record. They've done a lot of studies on that and other RDs, and things are largely satisfactory that the absolute accuracy is reasonably good. 
and when we do our tracking for contests, there's a 10% um, error allowed. <coughs> I guess the answer to that is you punch your money, your money takes your choice. Yeah. Did you uh, consider whether maybe the, each individual altimeter bay should have had, enclosed the same volume and maybe had the same ratio of volume to number of holes? Yeah, that, that would be a good thing to do. Uh, I didn't quite figure out how to do that as it's certainly in the time of the these projects get to the point where you think of all these things you're supposed to do, and then when it comes to actually doing the project, it's, it's time to do something, here's the model. But your point is, is well taken. Yeah. So, so Bob, I think you proved that at, at low speeds, like at Apogee, there's really no difference in altitude depending on the shape. But on the way up, um, there was a real difference. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it is at the... Uh, the biggest difference in the way of the top speed. What was the magnitude of the difference between the, the one in the big tube and the one in the little tube? It looked like it might be 10 or 20 percent or maybe even more. If, if you pick a tiny point and read down. Uh, no. Let's see if I can pick a tiny point in a hurry. Uh, looking at the C65 data after about, I'm going to go for the two second mark. And the difference was. Oh, from the largest diameter to the smallest diameter uh, was 186 feet versus 174 feet. That's a big difference. <laughs> so, yeah, that was, what, 12 feet. Uh, that's uh, about 7%, 7.5%. Yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> Are you aware of any uh, work that's been done to compare uh, altimeters to determine what the margin of error is among them? I know there's that work's been done, but I'm not really familiar with it. Well, guess what? Later tonight, somebody's got.